just after two o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, March 1st, 1881, the Russian Tsar, Alexander II, settled into his carriage for a short trip across St. Petersburg. He was on his way back to the Winter Palace after reviewing local troops and a quick visit with his aunt. Although the journey was a short one, a significant security detail accompanied Alexander. To have traveled without one would have been perilous. Since 1879, a small but potent group of revolutionaries had made it their mission to assassinate the Tsar in the hopes that a daring act of violence would prompt a peasant revolution. On several occasions, the terrorists came dangerously close to success. But good fortune seemed to follow Alexander. This day, his luck ran out. Two explosions extinguished the calm, and the Tsar now lay dying, his body ripped apart by a bomb. Today, we'll examine this reign of Alexander II, the Emperor of Russia from 1855 to 1881. Alexander II assumed the throne at a difficult moment in the country's history. His father, Nicholas I, had died in 1855, at a time when Russia was close to defeat in the Crimean War. This conflict pitted the Russians against the combined forces of the British, French, and Ottoman Turks. It arose after the Russians sought to exercise their protection for orthodox subjects of the Ottoman Sultan. The 1856 Treaty of Paris brought an end to the conflict, costing Russia strategic territory and its reputation as a military power. This defeat convinced the Tsar that if Russia wanted to compete against its Western European neighbors in the future, it would need to modernize and reform. The question was, where to start? Russia trailed its European adversaries and allies in many ways. Russia had remained decidedly rural and agricultural, even as industrialization and urbanization quickened in Western Europe. Almost 90% of the Russian population still lived in the countryside and farmed the land. Four out of five Russians couldn't read or write. The Russian Empire was more than 60 times larger than Great Britain, but had only one-tenth as much railroad track. Trade and development languished. On the surface, Russia's capital of St. Petersburg, with its pastel-colored, glittering palaces, seemed like a developed, flourishing city. But beneath the patina of culture and art, misfortune lurked. Cholera, typhus, and tuberculosis ran rampant. Illness, along with the eternal blights of fire and flood, gave St. Petersburg the highest mortality rate of any major European city. But nothing demonstrated Russia's backwardness more than the institution of serfdom. When Alexander II came to the throne, almost 40% of the population was tied to the landed estate on which it worked. In a country with almost 60 million people, more than 22 million human beings were enserfed. Serfs had a difficult lot in life and few rights. Though Russian law stipulated that the serfs couldn't be bought or sold apart from the property on which they worked, this was routinely ignored. Noble landlords administered justice, controlled the serfs' movements, and had the legal right to use corporal punishment against their serfs at will. In practice, little distinguished serfdom from slavery, like that practiced in the United States at the same time. Serfdom was not only an affront against modern notions of human dignity and civil rights, it was also an inefficient and unproductive economic system and the Russian economy languished as a result. And for this reason, Alexander, soon after coming to power, was determined to abolish it. Several of Alexander's predecessors had also seen the need to eliminate serfdom, but they'd avoided doing so for fear of the nobility's unfavorable reaction to losing their source of free labor. After Russia's embarrassing defeat in the Crimean War, Alexander saw no alternative but to begin dismantling the system of social and economic blight. Alexander II is known to history as the Tsar Liberator, but he was not a man of liberal beliefs. Instead, he was a man of common sense. He knew 
that for the economy to flourish, he needed to emancipate the peasants and liberate initiative and investment. Alexander also knew that he needed a well-trained, well-armed military for Russia to be a formidable European power. But this was impossible with an army of serfs who could use their training and weapons to turn against the state and system that oppressed them. It was clear, serfdom had to go. To get the nobles to agree to a reform that went against their immediate self-interest, Alexander appealed to the landowner's fear rather than to goodwill or reason. Speaking to an assembly of the Russian nobility in March of 1856, he told the crowd that change was inevitable and that the elites needed to ensure that they controlled the transformation before it was too late. Ominously, he warned his audience, it is better to abolish serfdom from above than to wait and have it forcefully abolished from below. In other words, the nobility and the autocracy should work together to determine the terms of the abolition of serfdom that would be most advantageous to the elites. To do so, Alexander formed commissions and eased censorship and the iron rule that had characterized his father's reign. This was to allow educated elites to suggest and debate the best way to end serfdom. Almost immediately, a deluge of new books and journal articles appeared. Authors whose opinions had long been silenced by fear and censorship discussed prospects for reform. Inevitably, they critiqued the status quo and inaugurated a, a tradition in which literature served as the battleground to debate the central political and social issues of life. It took several years to work out the details, and so discussions in the press became normalized, even expected. Alexander's Emancipation Manifesto was finalized on February 19, 1861, but Russians wouldn't learn the details for two more weeks. Alexander and his officials decided that it was best to announce the Emancipation Manifesto after Lent had started. Since Orthodox Christians typically refrained, at least in principle, from drinking alcohol during Lent, the government hoped that sobriety would discourage uprisings and rebe rebellions. The decree was announced quite intentionally on Forgiveness Sunday, with Alexander's troops standing on high alert across the empire. Alexander had good cause to worry that emancipation would provoke violence. In other words, he didn't view emancipation as the first step towards a constitution or the liberalization of his country. On the contrary, emancipation was designed to avoid a constitution and maintain the privileges of the crown and some of its aristocratic allies. In the words of Peter Kolchin, a historian at the University of Delaware, Russian emancipation was undertaken with the interests of the masters at heart and involved both financial compensation to owners and measures to ensure their continued authority in the countryside. So even though the serfs were technically freed, the emancipation didn't represent as big of a break with the past as you might expect. Officials realized that the 22 million serfs who would gain their freedom needed to be given access to land. Since Russia hadn't yet industrialized, there was no way beyond agricultural employment to absorb such an enormous labor supply. They needed to be able to farm and needed land to do so. But where was the land to come from? The only solution was to take some of the nobility's land. Yet the gentry's anger could prove just as dangerous as peasant frustration. So, Alexander decided to financially compensate the nobles for the land they lost. Every element of the ensuing arrangement benefited the noble landowners. They selected the lands they wanted to retain and set the price for the lands they turned over to the peasantry. These prices were artificially inflated since they included a cost for the free labor being lost. And because the Crimean War had depleted the state treasury, Alexander resolved that the peasants would pay back the state for the lands they gained 
Herein lies the beginning of the problem. The Emancipation Manifesto abolished personal bondage and freed the serfs, but it failed to give them what they wanted and what they needed the most, enough land to farm and flourish. Invariably, the nobles retained the best land for themselves. Newly freed peasants now worked less land than they had previously had under serfdom. And the land they worked was often less productive and less conveniently located. To add insult to injury, the Emancipation Decree indicated that the peasants would need to pay the state treasury back over the next 49 years at an annual interest rate of 5.5% in what became known as redemptive dues. Peter Colchin, the historian, says, given the class bias of the emancipation legislation of 1861, it is in many ways hard to imagine a less promising formula for the transition to freedom than that prescribed for the Russian peasants. Before the abolition of serfdom, the incidence of peasant disorders in Russia had been rather low. Only 126 peasant disorders were reported across the empire in 1860. But in the year after the emancipation of the serfs, the number of peasant uprisings rose to 1,889. The taste of freedom could be bitter indeed. It's interesting to note that even though the peasants rebelled, they still retained faith in their czar and looked upon him as a paternal figure. They abided by the old Russian proverb, God is in the heavens and the czar is far away. To the peasantry, the source of their oppression rested closer to home. Their ire focused on the nobility rather than the state. Still, another group of Russians weren't ready to let the state off so easily. Educated Russians believed that the systemic problems of inequality and injustice started at the top with the czarist system. No group expressed greater dissatisfaction than the Russian intelligentsia. This was a group of thinkers and writers who used literature to critique the existing order. They wrote literary essays, novels, and even literary criticism that were designed to pointedly critique the economic and political status quo. From the era of Alexander II forward, Russian intellectuals served as the moral conscience of their country. To many of the intelligentsia, serfdom was emblematic of the pervasive inequality and oppression that gripped Imperial Russia. The revolutionary 19th century writer Nikolai Chernyshevsky argued on the eve of emancipation that in Russia, everyone's a slave from bottom to top. So to the intelligentsia, the essential railroading of the peasantry in the Emancipation Decree was not a distinct episode of injustice. It was emblematic of a corrupt system that favored elites and sought to exploit the uneducated, underprivileged subjects while silencing dissent and critiques. With their hopes aroused by the prospect of the abolition of serfdom, that true reform would come to Russia, the disappointing specifics of the emancipation confirmed their worst suspicions about the state. Alexander realized that other reforms needed to complement the end of serfdom. In theory, it made sense that with a now freed population, the legal, educational, and military systems needed to adjust as well. But the limited and variable nature of the reforms convinced the Russian intelligentsia that even though serfdom no longer existed, true freedom was merely a pipe dream in the Tsarist state. One of the most important of Alexander II's reforms was in education. Universities were granted considerable autonomy and academic freedom. They permitted the import of foreign scholarly works and allowed Russian students to study abroad. But although these reforms seemed promising, and they did somewhat improve education, the results were far from revolutionary. They were privileges bestowed rather than rights granted. And as soon as the state felt, felt threatened by student organizations, protests, or full-blown disorders, 
this academic autonomy was curbed or disappeared entirely. Similarly, although Alexander II's era of great reforms included judicial reforms that allowed for regular courts and public jury trials, you couldn't say that there was uniformity within the legal system. The government carefully decided when to allow public tri jury trials. More often than not, when the crime was of a political nature, Alexander's regime dealt with radicalism and even simple dissent with military court martials behind closed doors or exiles by administrative decrees. In the era of the so-called great reforms, we see that the Tsar's government responded to the challenges and tensions in society by alternating reform and repression. Some of the most influential works of the period were written from a prison cell and distributed far beyond its walls by an author's sympathetic friends. A great example is Nikolai Chernyshevsky's famous work, What is to be Done? This is a utopian novel that inspired a generation of Russian radicals, including Vladimir Lenin. Chernyshevsky wrote What is to be Done from prison in 1862 after the government decided that some of his earlier writings had gone too far. But the novel's popularity soared, and rather than dissuade educated Russians from criticizing the government, state repression of figures like Chernyshevsky motivated others to take up the mantle because it confirmed their sense of the government's repression and corruption. In this way, Alexander's cultural relaxations had the unintended consequence of liberating moral, intellectual, and critical forces in society that previously rulers had repressed. Alexander had let the proverbial genie out of the bottle. When university students took advantage of educational reforms to demand more rights, the government grew alarmed. In answer to student protests in the 1860s, Alexander II's government banned student meetings, outlawed student associations, and raised university fees. The students viewed this about face as an arbitrary challenge to their autonomy, and they initiated massive demonstrations. Many students were beaten in clashes between the protesters and soldiers. And some youths who previously spent their days in St. Petersburg science labs now sat in the cells of the Peter and Paul Fortress right down the corridor from some of the imprisoned writers they'd idolized. So much for liberalization. But these harsh measures began to drive young Russians past their forebearers onto a revolutionary course. It was at this time that the Russian literary greats Ivan Turgenev, Fyodor Dostoevsky, and Lev Tolstoy began to publish some of their most important works. The decade after the emancipation of the serfs saw the publication of Tolstoy's War and Peace, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, and Turgenev's Fathers and Sons. I think Ivan Turgenev perfectly expresses the tension of the immediate post-emancipation period in his 1862 novel, Fathers and Sons. Set largely on the Kirsanov estate, the story brings two young Russians back from university at St. Petersburg for a visit home. Here, the young characters express a generation that was questioning everything. Arkady Kursanov and his nihilist mentor, Yevgeny Bazarov, reject everything but science. Or at least they try to, until their human emotions and pesky feelings of love annoyingly interfere. Arkady's beloved father and Bazarov's adoring parents struggle to connect with their sons their ideas, and thus their future. The Kursanovs fare better than the Bazarov family, though, since Arkady proves more susceptible to sentiment, while Yevgeny has lost his, has his heart broken and loses his life in his reckless pursuit of science. Through this intimate story of family, friends, and antagonist, Fathers and Sons presents two generations wrestling with the implications of a state in transition. It presents the arrival of liberals and a breed of radicals that Turgenev deems nihilist based on their renunciation of traditional religious and moral principles. These nihilists believe that the corrosiveness of privilege and oppression was so great that all institutions and beliefs had been infested. 
the older generation struggles with the pronouncement that their values are bankrupt. As Arkady's uncle Pavel angrily tells Bazarov, I cannot believe that you two really know the Russian people. No, the Russians are not what you imagine them to be. They hold tradition sacred. They are a patriarchal people. They cannot live without faith. But to the younger generation, Turgenev's nihilist, the time for accommodation and compromise had passed. Bazarov tells Uncle Pavel that our so-called progressives and reformers never accomplished anything. And as Arkady's father, Nikolai Kursanov, sadly complains, in spite of his efforts to keep up with the times, he has been left standing while his son has forged ahead. The emancipation of serfs and the corresponding reforms illuminated a fundamental generational rift. On one side were the fathers who wanted to reform distinct aspects of the old order. On the other side were the sons and daughters who felt betrayed by the lack of more fundamental change and who viewed the old order as so corrosive that the ground needed to be cleared before something could be built in its place. Alexander regularly walked through the summer garden in St. Petersburg, which Peter the Great had sculpted to suit his taste, from its elaborately carved trees and bushes to marble statues and fountains. The garden is right across the Neva River from the city's Peter and Paul Fortress. Crowds often gathered there to catch a glimpse of the Tsar, and though policemen would trail behind him, security was light. The common conception was that the emperor was the Russian's little father and need not fear his own subjects. But this came to an end on April 4th, 1866. After his daily walk, as Alexander II approached a waiting carriage at the edge of the garden, a gunshot rang out. It was fired by Dmitry Karakozov, a 26-year-old nobleman with ties to a radical circle known as hell. It's said that a peasant in the crowd jostled the gunman's arm at the pivotal moment, causing the bullet to miss its mark. Alexander survived for the time being, and Karakozov was quickly executed. The real casualty of this assassination attempt was the illusion that the person of the Tsar was sacred. Suddenly, he seemed all too human. A line had been crossed. A popular movement mobilized to improve the lives of the recently freed serfs. Radical thinkers such as Peter Lavrov and Mikhail Bakunin argued that Russia's privileged youth had a debt to repay to the masses, whose labor had generated their wealth and privileges. These new populists urged young privileged Russians to work in the countryside to help lead a peasant revolution that would turn into socialism. And in the summer of 1874, more than 2,000 Russian students answered the call as part of the Go to the People movement. But their odyssey was short-lived. Cultured strangers aroused attention and suspicion in the undeveloped villages of Russia. Before long, gendarmes arrested many of them. While most activists avoided prison terms, 193 of them were incarcerated and awaited trial for more than two years. This would be known as the Trial of the 193. When it began, proceedings were public affairs, thanks to Alexander's judicial reforms. And now, the plight of so many seemingly selfless young men and women aroused sympathy in liberal society. And even the acquittal of so many of them did little to mute resentment against Alexander and his government. Instead, the proceedings accentuated the injustice or inefficiency of a system that had consigned essentially innocent men and women to prison for more than two years. Russians didn't have much time to reflect on the trial of the 193, however. Day after it concluded, a young female revolutionary named Vera Zasulich shot and wounded the military governor of St. Petersburg, General Fyodor Trepov. Her bullet struck the general in the buttocks, an injury he survived, perhaps not surprisingly, and she didn't attempt to flee. She said that her assassination attempt was to avenge Trepov's brutal treatment 
of a political prisoner from the aforementioned trial of the 193. Tsar Alexander believed that with such a clear admission of guilt, a public trial of Zasulich was the perfect way to make an example out of the violent radicals. Then, in the spring of 1878, the unthinkable happened. The jury acquitted Zasulich, expressing sympathy to the defendant rather than to the victim or the state. The Russian historian Edvard Razinsky says, from this moment of the great humiliation of the law, the clock of the revolution started ticking. Months before the trial of the 193, an underground populist organization called Landed Freedom had sent some of its members to isolated villages to work amongst the people and talk to them about socialism and revolution. But this group's members were continually harassed by local officials, stymied in their work, and on the run from police. Impatient for change, a Land and Freedom member named Alexander Solovyov decided to employ a different course of action. On the morning of April 2nd, 1879, as Alexander began his daily walk, the Tsar encountered a young man dressed in a civilian uniform. This happened to be Solovyov. Just steps away, the Russian sovereign watched in horror as the man drew a revolver from his coat pocket and took aim. Amazingly, several shots fired at close range all missed their mark. Alexander had survived another assassination attempt. Solovyov, unlike Dmitry Karakozov, who tried to flee the summer garden after firing unsuccessfully at the Tsar more than a decade earlier, was resigned to his capture and death. Weeks later, the state hanged him in St. Petersburg's Semyonovsky Square before a crowd of thousands. The failed assassination attempt created a fissure within the populist Land and Freedom Group. While some members argued that killing the Tsar would accomplish nothing more than a change in Roman numerals after Alexander's name, others thought that terrorism directed at the emperor would initiate a revolution. The group that believed in violence broke away and in August of 1879 reconstituted itself as the people's will. Its mission was to end Tsarist depression and provoke a political revolution by assassinating the emperor. Roughly two dozen men and women formed the executive committee of the people's will. They justified their belief in violence through a willingness to sacrifice their own lives in the process. They renounced their worldly possessions, their personal ties, and their professional aspirations to devote themselves to the cause of revolution. This new breed of revolutionary didn't expect to survive the confrontation with the state. They vowed to become martyrs. Because of this, we can consider the people's will to be the first modern terrorist group. Members placed bombs under railroad tracks and even set off a massive explosion at Alexander's home, the Winter Palace, to no avail. Several dozen guards were killed or wounded in the latter explosion, but the Tsar was again unharmed. Then came March 1st, 1881. The conspirators had studied the emperor's movements for weeks. Alexander had abandoned many of his public activities but he still continued his Sunday tradition of watching military drills at the Mihalovsky Menage. With only two possible routes between the Winter Palace and the review grounds, the People's Will decided it was here that they would act. Along one route, they placed a mine under the road and waited, ready to light the fuse if the Tsar's carriage approached. Along the other route, young men stood with rudimentary handheld bombs to hurl at Alexander's carriage. When Alexander's carriage turned along the Catherine Canal, bypassing the route with the underground bomb, the terrorist leader, Sofia Perovskaya, gave the signal for the suicide bombers to act. The first explosion detonated, bringing the Tsar's carriage and horses to a halt. Several people lay gravely wounded, but in their midst, the unflappable and unharmed Alexander stepped from his carriage. Guards restrained the young bomb thrower, and the officer in charge of Alexander's security tried to get his boss to safety. 
But at this point, Alexander made a mistake that was to be his last. Instead of immediately getting into the sleigh to return to the palace, he walked along the canal to survey the damage. Now, a second explosion rang out. Snow, smoke, and debris filled the air. When it cleared, the Emperor of Russia lay in a pool of his own blood. He was alive, but fading fast. The guards loaded Alexander onto his sleigh and raced to the Winter Palace. But at 3.30 p.m., soldiers lowered the flags. The People's Will terrorist group had accomplished its mission. Alexander II was dead. Tsar's passing did not usher in the revolution that his assailants had hoped for. Instead, the revolutionary leader Vera Figner, another of those radical Russian women, said, the villages slept and the people stayed quiet and there would be no more reforms for now.